Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to focus on NNRTI resistance, which is an extremely important problem in clinical practice. Um, I'm going to begin by focusing in on some mechanism of action for the NNRTIs because I think it's important if we're going to be talking about specific mutations and binding pocket issues, it's important to understand the basic mechanism of action for the NNRTIs and have a basic understanding of the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So what we're going to be focusing in on is the main mechanism of action related to the inhibition of reverse transcriptase, which as you all know, plays an incredibly important role in the conversion of HIV RNA to DNA, this reverse transcription process, which is very unique to retroviruses. So looking at the reverse transcriptase enzyme, this is an enzyme that is uh, consisting of two heterodimers. It's a heterodimer. It's consisting of a P66 and a P51 subunit. The top P66 subunit also has an area called the polymerase active site, which I'll show you a little bit more in a second, which plays a very important role in the actual reverse transcription process. Now, conceptually, you'll see many renditions and articles and journals depicting this top P66 subunit as a hand-like region, depicting the finger region to your far left, to the thumb region in the back, and then the palm region. And the, the polymerase active site sits in the palm region. And looking at this, kind of imagining the palm and thinking about this, looking at the next slide, you can see as the RNA is converting into DNA in this RNA-DNA complex, it threads through the palm of the P66 region and it interacts with the active polymerase site. So this is essentially sort of from a um, mechanistic standpoint and, and sort of from a spatial standpoint how the conversion of HIV RNA to DNA occurs. Now, for our interest in talking about NNRTI inhibitors, the area to focus in on is this area in the P66 subunit called the NNRTI binding pocket. This is where our NNRTI drugs bind, and the binding of the NNRTI to this pocket region causes several interesting changes. Most notably, as you can see, it causes this hyperextension of the thumb region. If you hyperextend the thumb region on the P66 subunit here, what happens, looking over back at that polymerase site, the polymerase site is changed, the enzyme loses some of its function, but in addition it's sort of sprung or pushed upward, which causes it to lose some of the grip that it normally has on the RNA-DNA complex as it's threading through um, this heterodimer. Now, the, the additional thing that happens is this thumb acts like a little bit of a catalyst or pushing the RNA-DNA complex along as the transcription occurs. So when you hyperextend it and fix it in that position, it can't perform its normal action to extend along. Now, looking at that binding pocket, now we're going to blow this up and look at it in more detail over to the right. And this is just exploding this. And think of this more conceptually as a three-dimensional view and think of the drugs coming in, landing in, almost like a lunar module coming in, into this pocket. And you can see these, the amino acids that surround this pocket are these amino acids we're very familiar with, with genotypes, you know, the K103N, the K101, the E138. These are the amino acids that, that bound that bind up the pocket and you can you know imagine that changing one of these amino acids could impact the drug binding could impact it entering through the rim of this binding pocket or pushing it out through the bottom by a change as well and this just conceptually showing you that these mutations that occur with the NNRTIs typically line these amino acids they occur in the amino acids that line the pocket and it you know doesn't take too much imagination to see how this could prevent the drug from binding into the pocket now let's actually look at some common NNRTI resistance mutations, how they impact our clinical practice and what we see how the impact of these mutations on our genotype scores and on our, our actual drug efficacy. So let's look at, let's look at two patients. Uh, this was uh, about a month ago, I saw two very similar patients in clinic that I was attending on and this was in one afternoon and both of these patients had virologic failure and they brought up different issues. So patient one, was a 31-year-old man who was taking tenofovirum tricytabine efavirenz, or etripla, and the most recent two viral loads in this patient were elevated at 976 and 1645. So a genotype was ordered, um, and patient two was a 26-year-old woman who was taking tenofovir tricytabine ropivirine, or Complera, and the 
Uh, similarly, two viral loads recently were up at 648 and 1220. Now, a genotype was ordered on both of these patients. So thinking to yourself for a second, and, and what we're going to look at, these two very common regimens in clinical practice, what would you expect to see in patient one and in patient two? In other words, what would you expect to see if you fail a tripla? What would you fail, expect to see if you fail Complera? Well, let's look at this. There is clear data that, that guides us to understand what happens. And this is from the ECHO and the THRIVE trials. And these were essentially head-to-head -head trials that were efavirenz versus real piverine. So it isn't exactly a Complera versus a tripla. But what the ECHO trial did really was a, uh, uh, essentially a head-to-head -head in that regard because the backbone in that trial was tenofovir m So this was really essentially uh, atripla versus Complera. In the THRIVE trial, the, the two nukes that could be used were more versatile and there was a combination that were used. What they found in the ECHO and the THRIVE trial, if we look down in this graph, and I'll focus in on the most frequent in NRTI mutations and the most frequent NRTI mutations. With the favorins going down the brown column, what you can see is the K103N was the most common mutation. And then in the nuke, and then the nuke mutations, the M184V was the most common. Looking at real pivoting, it was very different. The E138K was the most common mutation, and it often occurred concomitantly with this M184I. And if you're not familiar with the M184I, it's a precursor to M184V. So when you're thinking about this clinically, really think about it very similarly. Now, we have additional data from three other trials, the 934, the ACTG5142, and the Startmark trial, all which showed us the same thing when people fail in a Favrins plus two nukes regimen. People get a K103N mutation by far uh, most commonly. And second most common mutation that you likely see is the M184V mutation. Visualizing this so that, that I think all of you can walk away and make sure we've all got a firm handle on these common mutations, if you look at wild type virus and you think about this in terms of a visualization of where these drugs are in terms of a susceptibility spectrum, if you add in mutations, you can sort of visualize what would happen. So for example, if we add in a K103N mutation, what you can see is this drives efavirenz and nevirapine very far over in the spectrum of high level resistance, but you can see it essentially has little or no impact on etrovirine or real pivoring. So kind of visualize that, that's what you see with the K103N mutation. If you look at the E138K mutation, which I said was the most common mutation that you see when patients fail real pivoring, you can see that in addition to getting intermediate resistance to real pivoring, the drug at the bottom of those four, you also get some low level resistance to efavirenz, etrovirine, and nevirapine. And if you see these two images, this is why you can hear people say, well, there's a little more impact from failing real pivoring overall in the class than there is with the favorins. Okay, now, this is a really interesting thing about real pivoring. If you add in this mutation, the 184i, which we really think about just as a nuke mutation with resistance to, uh, etro, uh, to, to m tricytabine or to lamivudine, interestingly, just developing that additional mutation pushes real pivoring all the way over into high level resistance. So it's a, it's a concept that's very different than what we're used to dealing with and that we're, we don't normally think of a 184V or I impacting the non-nucleosides, but this is an example where it does. Now let's look at the most complicated sort of scenario and situation that we deal with in the NNRTIs. And this is trying to figure out what do you do if you have a bunch of NNRTI mutations. So this is a 46-year-old man that was seen in the clinic for evaluation of a salvage antiretroviral regimen. He has an extensive antiretroviral treatment history with multiple episodes of virologic failure. A deep salvage regimen is being considered, and the most recent genotype test showed multi-drug class resistance, including these NNRTI mutations, L100I, K101E, K103N, which we just talked about with the favorins, and G190S. Not that you need to know these off the top of your head, but the question now that we're going to look at when you see a bunch of these NNRTI mutations, well, how do you figure out whether or not any of the NNRTIs are actually going to have any activity? The one teaching point that I would make here is when you see this type of pattern, the results and the fallout from this can be severe, and that's why we want everyone, when they have a regimen that they see is failing, we want them to get 
a genotype and get off of that failing regimen so you don't accumulate these multiple mutations as it occurred in this patient. So everybody has learned how to use the Stanford database, and this is just showing what happens what we, when we plug these mutations in the Stanford database, and you can see it's not pretty. You can see that you have extensive resistance across the class, including resistance to etrovirin with a uh, Stanford score of 60. Now, how did they actually figure this out to know that this really is representative of what would happen in terms of clinical practice? How they figured this out and how it's scored in the Stanford database is based predominantly on data from the DUET 1 and 2 trials where they looked at patients who failed on a regimen that include etrovirin and they looked at responses to people who received etrovirin as part of uh, other regimens. So what you can see here is that they weighted the different genotype mutations and essentially the higher the number, the higher the impact of that mutation was for resistance. And again, this is not something you need to memorize, but it's important to understand the framework for how we figure this out for etrovirin and where it's gonna work. So the patient that I just presented, well, what do we have? Well, he has a K101E, he has a G190S, he has a L100I, and if you use this mutation scoring system that was from the Duet 1 and 2, you can count it up and he has a score of five. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at what happened in terms of clinical responses in this trial, individuals who had on the far right a mutation score above four with the, with the system that they used had markedly reduced response. So we could conclude from the patient that we just presented that they're very unlikely to get a good response to etrovirin, which corresponds exactly with what you would see in the Stanford database as well, too.